He's trying to save my son's life. Why the bottle? Why the bottle? Why the bottle? As a doctor, that's like asking a pilot why they keep the doors closed. Very excited to be reacting to the first ever episode of The Good Doctor. I haven't seen it before and I will be adding some insights as a doctor working in London. This was recommended by Laszlo Cosmo, who's one of our Omega channel members. So thank you for your support. I'm a doctor. Let me take a look. His jugular vein's been cut. You're killing him. Ooh, I love how this is started. So it seems the guy who said you're killing him is the protagonist of the show, and he had sensory hyperstimulation, had been bullied as a child. I believe the producers are trying to get at a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder, although this wouldn't be how all patients present with the condition. In terms of the injury, there are a few things that are not quite right. Firstly, why would the patient be unconscious since they haven't actually lost a significant amount of blood? Did they bang their head on the floor? Is that why they're unconscious? Maybe even though the main external injury is in the neck, the actual problem is the in the patient's brain and pressing on his neck is limiting the blood flow through the jugular, making a hemorrhage or a bleed in the brain worse. The first thing I would want to establish here is that the patient's bleeding and has a pulse. Let's find out more. You have it in the wrong place. You would be in the right place if you were an adult. He is a boy, which means you're also putting pressure on his trachea, which means he's not currently breathing. There. <gasps> oh, the boy's breathing again. This isn't very accurate though medically, even if it is extremely entertaining. See, compressing the wound from the side the way the first doctor was doing it wouldn't actually compress the trachea enough to stop breathing. The trachea is actually held up by some cartilaginous rings which give it support and keep it patent. You can even basically try and push it while digging a thumb just above your sternal notch here. Mine's blocked by my signature tie. But even if you push as hard as you can, which I wouldn't recommend, you would still be able to breathe without a problem. I'm actually pushing pretty hard right now and I'm clearly talking, okay? Also, if it were compressed, you would easily hear the sound of stride on, upper respiratory sounds, and the patient wouldn't just stop breathing altogether. They would be breathing against that resistance like there is here. And here it looks like he's apneic, which would be an indication of something more severe, central in the brain. Some glass. He'll be fine. Who are you? Hello. I'm Dr. Sean Murphy. I'm a surgical resident at San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. Hello, Dr. Sean Murphy. Good to have you. So in the advanced trauma life support training, we learn an A to E approach. The A is for airway, make sure it's not obstructed. B is for breathing, you listen to the chest, make sure there isn't a huge pot of air on one side. C is for circulation, so blood pressure, heart rate, ECG. D is disability, so you check whether they're alert, responsive to voice, responsive to pain, unresponsive. Finally, E is exposure, checking them from top to bottom, making sure they don't have any other wounds because even if the patient is conscious, if they have one huge injury somewhere, adrenaline can actually numb their sensation so they wouldn't feel one elsewhere. And we would call that a distracting wound, like this patient has a big wound in the neck, but he's actually got a shard of glass in his abdomen as well. That neck is a distracting wound. Pretty good so far. Autism. He's high functioning, he's capable of living on his own. High functioning. Is that our new hiring standard? Yes, he has autism, but he also has savant syndrome. Who is this board member who's resisting employment of a patient with high functioning autism? Probably the same guy who would turn down a young Elon Musk or Anthony Hopkins. Judge people by the content of their character, not just a label. Speaking of a very interesting label though, savant syndrome is a rare condition that's actually associated with conditions like autistic spectrum disorder that can lead to incredible abilities and talents. It can be present at birth or acquired later. The name has French origins from the word savoir, which means knowing person. A notable example with the syndrome is someone called Kim Peek, who inspired the Rain Man movie and can memorize 
over 12,000 books, is an expert in 15 different subject areas and could read two pages in a book all at once. He could actually read and memorize two whole pages in a book in eight seconds. Madness. Now here's a question for you smart people. How do the left and the right brains talk to each other? Drop your answers down below. The, the chest is moving paradoxically. The left lung is in distress. I need a knife. There is a medical emergency. Well, I'm not gonna give you a knife. Yes, I'll ask you. Weapon! Weapon! Did he just steal a knife from airport security? Also, how is security not there with the patient trying to move people away from this potentially dying person in the middle of an airport? You should be giving this guy all the kit he needs to be able to save that patient. Which should also be an emergency first aid kit, which he should have been provided. This is totally next level stuff. Speaking of next level, if you're enjoying this episode and would like access to exclusive channel perks, then check out the channel membership. Not only does it support me, but it also gives you the ability to suggest a series, an episode for me to react to, get early access to videos and many other perks. For a limited time only, if you join, you could get entered into a raffle to win a one-on-one -on -one session with me to discuss whatever you like for an hour and access to all other future giveaways, which can include cash prizes. So press join down below now to secure your spot. He's trying to save my son's life. Why the bottle? Why the bottle? Why the bottle? As a doctor, that's like asking a pilot why they keep the doors closed. You need to maintain a negative pressure inside the chest wall and putting the other side of the tube under a liquid helps to maintain that negative pressure by allowing air to flow outwards and nothing to flow back. That's called an underwater seal and we actually use that as a seal for chest strains inside hospitals when we do this procedure. So it is pretty standard. I do think what he's doing here is very impressive, but most surgical residents could probably do the same without being a savant. Now one mistake here is that he also used bourbon whiskey to disinfect. A better option would be hand gel, which is generally for sale in most places, even pre-COVID when this was filmed. That's because 40% alcohol is actually doesn't sterilize. It mildly suppresses bacterial growth. 70% alcohol almost sterilizes a surface, which is what hand gel has. Now, another question for you smart people. Does 100% alcohol sterilize better than 70%? Justify your answer down below. A homemade one-way valve. <laughs> you saved his life. Sean, where are you? Call me as soon as you can, please. Oh, he's late for work because he's been helping in an emergency. That happened to me once. I was on my way to work and a cyclist had been hit by a car and was stuck in the bike frame. I managed to stop and free him to safety until the paramedics got there as he had some lower back pain so I had to keep him immobilized. Luckily his fall was cushioned by a delivery bag. He was actually making a delivery. His customers were probably a bit confused why their delivery was going to the hospital rather than to their house. Priorities. Also yes, the doctor did incredibly well to put together the pieces of equipment that were needed here but there's a lot of work to be done to get the patient stable. Even with the chest drain in, he could be septic or still hemorrhaging in the right internal jugular. So it's a bit early to crack open the champagne. I need to get to San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. That's where we're going. What did you do? Sean! Hello! The boy's ECG changed. Eight-year-old healthy boy, status post-encounter with a shattered glass sign, numerous lacerations. Echo. Oh, this is getting seriously spicy. I'll be checking for jugular venous distension here and pulses paradoxes as the patient probably has cardiac tamponade now. What I find a bit odd here is that the management that our savant is suggesting is actually routine management, nothing groundbreaking really, as trauma cases happen all the time and are managed similarly to what's being suggested. Paramedics are actually trained to insert emergency chest drains in a similar way that he did. Let's see if he steps it up a notch. He just seemed very smart with the patient earlier as the other doctor was a little bit out of his comfort zone. Echocardiogram? Who is this guy? I'm the doctor. That is cool. 
no indication that an echocardiogram is necessary. He can't even reliably show up for a job interview. But it's so interesting that everyone's doubting him, even though he literally just saved the patient at the scene. I love how the operating surgeon appreciated his handiwork with the bottle. One thing that isn't quite accurate here though is that if you look at the bottle, there was no bubbling out of it, which I would be very worried about, as to me that would mean that the chest drain is blocked, unless the fluid was swinging in and out with pressure changes in the chest. Since you would expect bubbling until the tear in the lung sealed itself and that would take at least a week and it's literally just been a few hours. I also can't wait to see if Dr. Murphy shuts this doubter up. We hire Sean and we give hope to those people with limitations that those limitations are not what they think they are, that they do have a shot. Wow, this guy is the president of the hospitals board and he's standing up for diversity and inclusion. This is literally what it takes to make change. Someone in power who can advocate for those marginalized groups. In William McCaskill's bestseller book, What We Owe the Future, he talks through how if one man named Benjamin Lay of the Quakers hadn't spearheaded massive action to bring attention to the cruelty of slavery, then there is a possibility it could still be present today. It just takes one spark to start a fire. You can listen to the audiobook of What We Owe the Future with a free trial of Audible, so check that out down below. It's also an affiliate link, which means you'll be helping the channel if you sign up for a free trial. Something's changed, something's different. You asked earlier about an echo. You had no medical reason, but you asked anyway, why? There was this weird guy, the one that did the one-way valve, he kept insisting. That oh, finally, they're gonna wait until the patient arrests before taking the advice of the guy who literally saved him at the scene. It's not difficult to stick an ultrasound probe on his chest to check if he's bleeding into the heart sac, especially since he's literally just had a rain shower with glass. If it punctured his lung, then why not other thoracic compartments like the pericardium? Also, the junior surgeon labeling someone else as weird just because they're different to her? Why? Who made you international arbiter of normal? One of the only consistency between the greats in history is that they were weird, if you define that as different to the pack. I love it when people think or act differently to me because it's an opportunity to actually learn something, as you'll see by some of the people I speak to in the comments. We're gonna go find your weird guy. Why the echo? Pericardial effusion. Oh, we're coming right back up. Thank you. They did the echo. It's normal. Which means we just wasted our time. There's a concave deformity in the right atrium. Oh, Savant is showing them up again here. He's finding the abnormality where the others couldn't. The truth is though, if it wasn't that obvious, then probably too small to be clinically significant anyway. Although I love what they're doing with this show, empowering neurodiverse people in the workplace. Some things should be made clear though. Healthcare providers are generally not incompetent as they seem to be showing here. Much of what he's actually suggesting is standard protocol. Not all people with autistic spectrum disorder are high functioning or will have savant syndrome and some special talent. The vast majority of people with autistic spectrum disorder are disabled by it by some degree with some exceptions. The puncture of the SVC, a blood could be leaking behind the heart, restricting the heart's ability to expand and fill during diastole, reducing the heart's efficiency. Oh, I think our savant found his match. That is quite an outlandish theory, especially as on echo, they usually take multiple views, not just anterior, which means the effusion would still be seen even if it were posterior. They also wouldn't be so interested in finding a reason to do the echo since the low blood pressure is reason enough. It does make for amazing television though. Let's see what they suck at. All against. You need to go online. You were right. You saved that boy's life. Oh, I wonder what the board is saying after seeing that video. 200,000 views on YouTube already. So you're telling me all I have to do to go viral is save someone in the airport? Easy, I'll just unpack my wife's Primark sunglasses. Also, I feel like our savant 
deserves some kind of a bonus for saving someone at the airport. Claps don't pay the bills. And the poor guy was homeless for ages. Bring in the Benjamins. Why were you rude to me when we first met, then nicer to me the second time we met, and now you want to be my friend? Which time was it that you were pretending? Oh, which time was it that you were pretending? Oh, wow. This may sound harsh and catty, but he's actually asking a genuine question here. He wants to understand and rationalize human interaction so that he can try and learn to respond appropriately as it may not come naturally to him. Those learned behaviors can help mask some of the difficulties people with high functioning autistic spectrum disorder face and allow them to improve with time. It also is brilliant seeing her get called out that way though. Wow. It's like an amazing book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Beep that talks about how everyone needs a massive panda that could knock on their door and just tell them how it is. Welcome Dr. Murphy, our panda. You're going to die one day. I just wanted to remind you. I'd like you to tell us why you want to become a surgeon. My brother went to heaven in front of my eyes. I couldn't save them. Wow, Dr. Murphy has been through a lot of trauma. His dad killed his rabbit, so him and his brother had to run away. He watched both his brother and his rabbit die, and he never wants to see another child die prematurely. I respect that. That answer beats, I like science and helping people every single time which was my answer in med school interviews. I'm watching this 12 years too late. They should have had children of their own and I want to make that possible for other people. And I want to make a lot of money so that I can have a television. I love that dash of humanity on such an intense story. Beautiful way to break the tension. I do like how the backstory blends well into his current motivations. It does feel as though there is a depth of character here and a lot of unresolved storylines and questions like the president just put his job on the line to back Dr. Murphy saying that if he messes up, he'll resign. Would love to see how that all ends up. I want to be the first to welcome you to San Jose St. Bonaventure Hospital. Murphy. Section. Never forget, you're the smart one. Oh, that feeling when you first scrub up and get to stand at the surgical table is awesome. It definitely didn't go that smoothly for me though. It's more like fumbling over the sterile equipment, having to throw two gowns away, accidentally scratching your nose and desterilizing yourself, then needing to do the whole process again. A lot of fun though. I did want to be a surgeon for quite a while. Now I'm in family medicine. It is a better lifestyle. So far, I'd say this episode gets 10 out of 10 for entertainment, about four out of 10 for accuracy and five out of 10 for diagnosis. Quite fun to watch. You can do anything and I'm proud of you, Sean. But you've seen many of these. Well, you don't belong here. So as long as you're part of my team, this is all you're ever gonna be doing. Suction. Ah, oh, surgeons have a bad reputation for being arrogant, but this guy steps it up a notch. Where I went to medical school, I actually saw a surgeon throw a scalpel at the floor right next to a scrub nurse's foot and landed blade down, stuck into the floor. It was desterilized, of course, and easily could have pierced her foot, although no one was injured. Mostly though, that stereotype doesn't actually hold up and surgeons are some of the nicest, funniest people you could meet. When things are high stakes though, of course they can get intense. Let's see how Murphy reacts. I have a lot to learn from you. You're very arrogant. Do you think that helps you be a good surgeon? Does it hurt you as a person? Is it worth it? Does it hurt you as a person? Murphy, what a comeback. Drop the mic, slam dunk, yes please, just walk out. <laughs> Giant Truth Panda strikes again. Now will I strike again by getting the diagnosis before Hustus? Find out here. Stay curious.